Thanks for checking out this online resource. We here at Calvary Community Church hope it's a help to you in your own spiritual journey. But online resources can't replace our engagement with the local church, where we can serve with others, we can worship with others, we can do life together and reach out to the community. If you live near Calvary, we invite you to join us 6 p.m. Saturday or 9 or 11 Sunday morning for one of our weekend services. If you live at a distance, just email us at info at calvarycc.org and we'll help you find a church where you can get grounded and growing in Christ. Thank you, Troy. And uh, you got another glimpse, and some of you it might be the first time to see it. Some of you might have seen that three or four times, but hopefully it gives you a glimpse of what Generations is about in terms of the tools. And I've brought uh, Andy and Mackenzie Thompson up here with me because I think they visualize for us uh, not the tools, but what those tools are going to be used for as we invest in the generations to come. Last week we looked back at God's faithfulness to Calvary in the early generations, the steps of faith they took. And uh, now we have Andy and Mackenzie here and we're going to look forward. And so introduce yourselves and your little guy, Andy, and tell us a little bit about you guys. Yeah. <laughs> So the third time, the, the first, last night's service, late in the discussion, he grabbed the microphone. Then in the nine, it was midway through, and now right at the start, he's going for the mic. He's warming up. So my name is Andy Thompson. This is my wife, Mackenzie, and this is our son, Huck. And uh, we, have a, <laughs> we have a baby girl uh, on the way that's due in August. And so, that, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> now, I know that you came to Christ as a boy. And Mackenzie, you came to Christ through relationships here at Calvary, but then you guys met, and your, your journey involves a lot of Calvary. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. We met through uh, a whole collection of, of friends here at Calvary, and uh, so you met here. We met here, and, and uh, we were married uh, by Pastor Drew Sams when he, when he was part of Calvary, and we dedicated Huck to the Lord. I think it was last year, wasn't last it? Last year. Yep. And Mackenzie was, uh, was baptized here. I had the opportunity to baptize you. You came to Christ through relationship here. And then when were you baptized? When were you baptized? Uh, in 2012. 2012. And, um, you know, the verse we've been sharing throughout generations, Psalm 78, 6, just jumps to mind as I talk to you guys. So the next generation would know, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. And I think they represent a lot of that. Not just... They're here not just to represent who they are, but they represent all the young families in our church, young couples, people who are, are, these are the emerging generations, not the early generations, but the emerging generations. And when it says in the verse, even to the children yet to be born, what we're doing is not just for Huck and for his parents, but for that little girl who's going to be born in August. And I know when I first shared with you guys, uh, or when I shared with the congregation, update on the Calvary 2020 vision in February. You emailed me, Andy, like before 2 p.m. that Sunday to say how excited you guys were. What excited you about what you've heard about in Generations, and why are you guys passionate about it? First off, just overall seeing the growth across Calvary, across many different spectrums, and we saw the numbers again today. Uh, one aspect that really spoke to me was seeing the young adults ministry that has grown tremendously. I was a young adult here before I met my wife, and there just wasn't the ministry was not thriving, and I think that that's something that's a segment of our congregation that is is so vital to this church and for every church to grow mm -hmm. and to see and hear that that has just grown tenfold by providing the space through the high school ministry and hearing about how the, how the high school ministry has grown as well just gave me so much encouragement for what this church is becoming and you know now being a dad and of one and one more on the on the way and you know, we, we stand up here as, as one couple, but there's so many young couples in this church. We're part of a small group with, with a lot of young couples, young families. And, and you know, we, we're excited for all of us and for, and for what the next generation of, of Christ is, uh, is doing, you know, in, in, his, in his church. And so, to, you know, to think about the high school, or I'm sorry, the middle school room. And, and you know, yes, we have the space for it now, but... You know, middle school is a tough age, and, and to provide these kids with every resource possible, you know, I just think about Huck and, 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 our, and our daughter and, and, and all these kids just That's great. benefiting from that is just amazing. And Mackenzie, as you uh, picture Huck and uh, uh, your little girl growing up here, what kinds of things do you think about when you, when you see a fly-through like that or you hear what we're planning to do? 
I'm just excited for more growth, for more families, um, to see Huck grow in the Lord and um, just see growth in elementary and middle school safety for the, the kids. Just it's so important. I told them, don't worry about that. You're, we, all of us parents have been there, right? Are you with me? All right. He He's doing be, great. He wants to be the center of attention. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just excited for, yeah, the growth and what the Lord is doing in this church. Yeah. Yeah, and you—you you are too. I we have to right? clean this microphone after this. Give me knuckles. Give me knuckles. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you guys, and I, I wanted you to, you know, put faces to what we're doing, and that they're an active part of who we are. They indicated when when he emailed me, he said we're in. We're hoping God blesses our business act, activity because we want to be a part of this. And I want to pray for Andy and Mackenzie and all the young couples, the, the emerging families in our church. And I want to ask you to join me. If you just want to stretch a hand out to them as I pray for them, we're praying for that generation. Father, thank you for Andy and Mackenzie and Huck and the little baby girl that's on the way. I pray that you'd give Mackenzie health and strength. I pray for them as a family, that you'd bless them. Bless all the young families here at Calvary. Lord, we love the opportunity to speak into the lives of young parents and children and be able to walk with them as they raise Huck and their daughter in you. And we know they're swimming upstream in a culture where the values are changing. And we want to help them equip their kids to live in love like Jesus in the world. And we ask that you bless them and all the, the young families that are part of Calvary. Pray for, Lord, we pray that we would be a generation ready to commit to make a difference in their lives and even those who will join us in the future. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you, Huck. You did a great job. You did a great job. I wanted you to um, see them because I, I think we have to understand that good intention, sincerity, excitement has to turn into action and commitment and generosity. I, I've met a number of you in uh, grocery stores and restaurants over the last several weeks as we've been emphasizing generations. And uh, people have said to me, we're so excited about generations and what, what God is doing in our church. And I so appreciate that you've been encouraging. And I, I've been excited, but I knew there was a point at which we had to move from good intentions and sincerity to a place where we make commitment and take action to impact families such as this. And today is that day. And uh, I want us to talk about how what we're doing for Christ here at Calvary is more than good intentions. If you open your Bibles or turn on your mobile device to a Bible program or Google uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 1 through 9. If you turn there, please. I, uh, I have with me uh, the uh, commitment that, uh, the commitment card that Leslie and I have completed. We've been praying about this even before this all went public. We knew that the leadership was planning and praying in the background and, and uh, we have made a commitment. And we made a commitment that we believe is stretching us. We're a little scared about what God has called us to give as he's asking all of us to make a commitment to a part of Calvary uh, for three years above and beyond our regular giving. We're a little scared about it because God has stretched us and maybe you've come in here having prayed about this and God has stretched you. But at the same time, we're excited to see how God is gonna provide for us, how he's gonna provide for all of us here at Calvary and ultimately for us as a church. And so we come here ready to make that commitment. And we even talked, uh, Leslie's out of town, and uh, she went back east for a funeral. As we were driving Thursday to the airport, to, I was going to drop her off. We, we talked about how we've got to move beyond good intentions. And, and loving the idea of sharpened tools that maximize this campus to reach the hurting people in our community that make a difference in the lives of families with early childhood kids and elementary kids and middle schoolers and even transform our adult ministries. And we, we, we talked about how it had to move beyond good intentions. And we knew this moment was coming. And God has been working in our hearts. And I hope he's been working in your heart. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, there's a, a, a great story here. This is the time of King David, about a thousand years before Jesus walked on planet Earth. David has reigned as the king of Israel for 40 years. His reign is coming to an end. He's actually anointing Solomon to be the next king. And in those 40 years, uh, David had a successful season of leadership. He has unified 12 tribes, which was pretty tough. 
He has taken all of the land that God had promised to Abraham. They now possess it, and they have peace with their neighbors. And so later in his, his reign and in his career, he had a, a, a passion in his heart to build a permanent dwelling place for God, a place of worship that would lift up the name of his God in Jerusalem. Now, up until this point, for centuries, they have used the tabernacle, which was a mobile tent-like structure that they could establish and tear down and put it back up and tear down. And now that they have the land and they're in the land and possessing all of it for the first time, David asked the Lord if he can build a temple for his name to replace the tabernacle. And uh, the Lord says, no, I, I appreciate what you're doing and what you're thinking, but you have shed too much innocent blood to be the one who builds it. But I'm going to let you raise all the funds for it, all the materials for it. I'm going to give you the plans, but you're not even going to see it. Your son Solomon is going to build it. And so David probably is disappointed in one way, but then he says, all right, but I'll do everything I can to set Solomon up to be able to build that temple, a, a place where the Lord would be glorified. Now, in our generation's campaign, we understand that this building is very different than the Old Testament tabernacle or temple. In the Old Testament tabernacle or temple, the intimate express presence of God dwelt in a special way in the Holy of Holies. And they would have to go there to meet God in his intimate expressed way. In the New Testament, we are told that the Holy Spirit comes into each believer in Christ and every one of us is a temple of God. We have the intimate express presence of God in our lives. This building does not. So when we're all gone at two in the morning later tonight, there's nobody in this building. God's presence is here in the sense that God is always present everywhere equally at all times. But his intimate express presence isn't here. It will be in your bed. He will be with you because we, the people of God, are now the temple of God. But facilities like this and a wonderful campus like this is used for the Lord's glory to make sure others come to know Jesus. They begin to grow and are discipled to walk with him and to become like Jesus. And so this is a tool that God has given us. So we understand the difference in what we are doing in terms of the building project. But I want you to hear the heart of David and his generation. And I want us to examine ourselves, whether we as individuals, as families, and as a church, have the same heart they have that moves beyond good intentions and sincerity and takes action and commitment and generosity. So we're going to see in this passage that leaving a legacy of generational impact requires personal commitment and active generosity, not just good intentions. Today's the day we decided we're going to leave a lasting legacy beyond ourselves in enhanced tools for the Lord's glory here at Calvary. You can follow along on the screen or on your text there. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation because it takes some of the numbers here and makes sure that we understand them in modern terms. And so the text will appear on the screen. First Chronicles 29, David is speaking to the whole congregation. He's anointing uh, Solomon, his successor, and he says this to the whole assembly that's gathered. Then King David turned to the entire assembly and said, My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous. It's a big project. Our project, the generation's project, is enormous. It's a renovation. It's going to be disruptive. It's a $20 million project. I don't, I don't think in those terms of dollars. I don't know if you do or not. It's a huge challenge. But notice he says, for the temple he will build is not for mere mortals. It is for the Lord God himself. And this building, even though it's not the place of the intimate express presence of God, it is a tool for God and for his glory. And whatever we do to enhance it and make it more effective and efficient for the cause of Christ, it's for the Lord himself. Verse 2, using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. Now there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great qualities of onyx, other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. And now because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I am giving all of my private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is in addition to the building materials I have already collected for his holy temple. 
I've not only given the building materials, I have given all of the things that will make this an, an, an ornate and beautiful building to the Lord's glory. Verse 4, I am donating more than 112 tons of gold from Ophir, 262 tons of refined silver to be used for overlaying the walls of the buildings, and for other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Look at this, this phrase here at the end of verse 5. Now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? Who will, who will join me? Today I'm asking you, who will join us in leadership here as we move forward? Verse 6, then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals and the captains of the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave willingly. That's key. So all the leaders, and scholars believe that as they bring these gifts, these are gifts they've collected from the rank and file, from their tribe members, from their soldiers. They bring all these gifts together and they bring them before the Lord. For the construction of the temple of God, they gave about 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. They also contributed numerous precious stones, which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord under the care of Jehel, the descendant of Gershon. Now, some people have taken all the description here and tried to put it into today's dollars. And all the estimates are between 1.5 and 1.7 billion dollars worth of materials between David and the people. Interestingly, too, researchers say that actually everything David gave would have been enough to build the temple. So why does he then call on the people? Because as a leader, he knows, and he's asking them to give willingly. He doesn't make a law or an edict. He doesn't appeal to the law of Moses. He wants them to join in this journey that he's on, and some of them are in his generation, so that they may not even see this themselves. As a matter of fact, David dies, and it's 20 years after his death. Solomon takes 20 years to build this. It's got so much in terms of, of beauty and structure. And so he's calling on people to join him in the journey. He said, follow my example. Now look at verse 9. They bring this great offering. Uh, for the glory of the Lord, the people rejoiced over the offerings, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And King David was filled with joy. I don't think he was just filled with joy because all these materials were gathered. But as a leader, he knew that they were in. They're going to grow. Somebody asked me, well, Sean, if, if after, with the commitments and then the gifts to come, if, if the $20 million doesn't come in in three years, won't you be disappointed? Well, humanly speaking, yes. But spiritually speaking, to me, this is more about what Leslie and I went through, what some of you have gone through, what maybe you go through today and in the, the years ahead. It's a, it's a spiritual journey for us. I'll tell you, even since I was a teenager, up until now, uh, the, the most powerful times in which God has stretched me to trust him by faith have had, it has to do with my finances. And what are my priorities? And that's what David is rejoicing in here. Now, I want to make a couple observations about David's generation. They were a generation that was ready to move beyond good intentions and sincerity and actually make a commitment to be generous to the Lord's work and to leave a lasting impact. How do you know that a generation is ready to do that? Well, I think there are three descriptors of them that ought to be true of us if we're ready on this day to make this kind of commitment. Number one, they eagerly celebrate the opportunity to give. Verse 9, the people rejoiced over the offerings. They rejoiced. Now, we're not necessarily a culture that's very demonstrative. Some of you may be, and you know, my most demonstrative is yay. Uh, but I, I'm very demonstrative in my heart. Uh, we're not just that culture even here in the Westlake area, but even at Calvary. But I know that there are times when a powerful song is sung that people will stand and applaud or applaud or say amen or shout hallelujah. Uh, sometimes in the middle of a message, someone will applaud a point or, or say amen, and I appreciate that. Uh, my brother, when I'm away, texts me how many times people applaud, like Pastor Brian Howard when he's up here, and he'll say, Brian got four times people applauded what you said. <laughs> and last week, I don't remember anybody applauding anything you said, where they four times applauded what he said, I should say. Uh, 
So we have a little fun with that. Wherever I am in the world, he likes to text me that. This only a brother can do. But, you know, I've, I've heard people uh, 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 applaud or say amen during a message. I, I've been in big churches, little churches. I've been in churches on different continents. I've been in rural churches, city churches. I've heard people, when it comes to a song, a sermon, even a prayer that seems to bring heaven down, people will say amen. They'll, they'll applaud. They'll celebrate. But I have yet to hear any congregation when the pastor says, will the ushers come forward, we'll now receive our offering. I have yet to hear a congregation say, hallelujah. You know what I notice when I say, the ushers will now come down, I see this. <laughs> but it says here, the people rejoice over the offering. They eagerly celebrate the opportunity to give. Some of you came in and go, oh man, I thought we were gonna miss this weekend. We were trying to avoid Commitment Sunday. But I hope you've come. I mean, as Leslie and I have wrestled with this, we, we're ready. And we want to celebrate whatever God's going to do here, whatever commitments are made, and how he's going to take care of this in the next three years. They eagerly celebrate the opportunity to give. The kind of generation that's ready to make a lasting impact, impact celebrates just the opportunity to give. Secondly, they willingly exercise their freedom to give. In the middle of verse, it says, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. They celebrate because they did this out of freedom. He doesn't say, I'm making it an edict that everybody must give 2%. He doesn't say, you ought to give or, or you're gonna look embarrassed. There is a freedom, and this is unusual in the Old Testament. Usually there is a law. Usually there is a king saying, you do this. But he says, just give freely. It says that in the end of verse 6, it says that when all these offerings come, all gave willingly. How can we give willingly? How can we give with freedom? You see, they, they willingly exercise their freedom to give. We give because God has been good to us and how he's blessed us. I mean, just stop and think about how you've been blessed, but to the majority of the people in this world, we are greatly blessed. Just start with the greatest blessing of all is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us, sent Jesus to die on the cross. He was buried and rose again so that not by our own merit, not by our own works, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in Jesus, he showers us with his grace, his goodness we don't deserve, and he makes us his children, forgives us, and gives us an eternal home in heaven. That is God's goodness at its height. And let me just say that if you... If you have never put your faith in Jesus, stop trying to clean up your act enough. Stop trying to be good enough and just put your faith in the one who loved you and died for you. You will receive the goodness of God, the grace of God. And that's the starting point of God's grace. Then we look at how he's provided for us in our health, our experience, our education, our professionalism, whatever you, the composite of who you are, everything you have has come from God. Everything I have has come from God. I am blessed, you are blessed, and we are, yes, to enjoy those blessings, but we are to be rivers of blessings, not reservoirs of God's blessings. They willingly exercise their freedom to give. They freely give to the Lord. And we give to God because God has given to us. He doesn't use intimidation as he talks to his people. He doesn't use coercion. He doesn't use manipulation or obligation. And if when we come to the commitment time, you feel like you've been coerced, manipulated, intimidated, or obligated into this, I'd rather you not give. In the New Testament, it says God loves a cheerful giver. We ought to rejoice and be able to give freely as God has blessed us in proportion to how God has blessed us. Now, we have really attempted to cast vision of what God has called us to as leaders. And we've done that in two ways. We want to inform you. So we've, we've tried to show you charts. We've tried to show you the fly-through. We've tried to communicate information about the project, about what it's going to accomplish, the goals of the project. We've tried to inform you. We've also tried to inspire you with stories of lives that have been changed now, and we just want to see that multiplied in the days and months ahead. We believe this is, as I said, it took 20 years 
for the full impact of what David was doing on this day to be felt. And it is possible that some of us will be with Jesus because we believe this is a 20-year investment. As this uh, building is, is enhanced and uh, completed in the next couple of years, we think this is an investment we're making in this generation that's gonna last at least 20 years and a continuing ripple effect. I think we're ready today to willingly give because of the freedom we have to give because God has been good to us. Thirdly, they deliberately surrender any excuses to give. They deliberately surrender any excuses to give. It says, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. Wholeheartedly means they're all in. They're not doing it begrudgingly. They're not doing it with hesitation. They're not piling up the excuses. On our way to LAX, as we'd had a number of discussions and we'd prayed together, and Leslie and I were talking the other day, it was interesting how each of us was bringing up reasons why we probably shouldn't put the number down that God was calling us to put down. It's just natural. Well, we need this home improvement, which we do. We need this, we need that, we need this, we need, and we, you know, we thought, but wait a minute, could those things be delayed? Could we make other choices? Could we, and, and there's just a pile of excuses we can come up with, and Satan loves to give us excuses why we don't invest in what God is doing. But we need to lay all those excuses aside so that we continue to move forward. And we were talking, and I, I told her about the video I'm gonna show you now, and I told her I'd seen it just a couple days earlier, and uh, I, was, I was sent this video on Tuesday, and uh, they wanted to know what I thought of it, and I was eating lunch, and I was, I was uh, writing some notes, and I had a water bottle there, and I leaned my iPhone against the water bottle to play this video that our team sent me, and, and uh, I was doing other things. And then in the middle of the video, as you'll see in a moment, a mom of a child with uh, special needs says, everywhere we go, people turn away from us. But at Calvary, they welcome us with open arms. And she wasn't just talking about her disability ministry. She was talking about you and how you welcome those families in the lobby and how you welcome them in this room, even if a child with a disability squeals or makes a noise in the room. And I love that you do that. But when she said, everywhere we go, people turn away, but not here, I thought, oh, that's what it means to live in love like Jesus, to look people in the eye that maybe nobody else will look in the eye and value them as God values them. I was so moved by this. I, I cried through the rest of it. I stopped eating and writing my note and just picked up the iPhone and stared at it. And I thought, oh my goodness, wow. You're gonna watch, this video talks about how we're gonna need to enhance and transform areas for early childhood and children's ministry. You'll see them, the kids singing. Then you're gonna see the complexity of our special needs ministry moving from their room upstairs down to their playground. It takes them about 15 minutes to go down and 15 minutes up. You'll see it from the view of a young man in a wheelchair. Then you'll hear from two moms, both moms of kids with disability. You'll see Tracy and Brandon. Brandon, when he was born, was shaken by one of his parents and suffered shaken baby syndrome. He was born a typical child with no difficulties. But after he was shaken, he was left with intellectual and physical disabilities, and it was determined he would never walk. Of course, he was removed from his home, put into foster care. And then a woman named Tracy, a single woman, knew the, the folks who had him in foster care, fell in love with Brandon, and intentionally sought to love him and adopt him and make him her own. And to this day, she loves him. It's been about 10 years. She's been his mom. And you'll hear her talk about her story. And then there's another mom, Hannah. And Hannah has two daughters with special needs. And... Uh, Hannah is the one who says, everyone else turns away, but here we're welcomed. And to me, that it just moves me. And both of these moms have chosen to love their kids. And I'm thankful that we've loved their kids with them, and we get to expand our opportunity to love more families like these in transforming the campus. Watch this video. One of the complexities of our special needs ministry is it's on the second floor. We have a great special needs playground that's down on the first floor, but our special needs ministry is upstairs, and it can take 12 to 14 minutes just to bring them down and get them to the playground. There's just no more room on the first floor in our current uh, layout of the building. Whereas in our plan with the Generations Campaign, 
they're gonna be right down there on the first floor. They're gonna have direct access out of their doors to the special needs playground that's designed just for them. And that's gonna improve our ministry to kids with special needs. And so we're going to be moving our children and our special needs ministries into designated space that will be designed for them. It'll be safe and secure for them, an environment where they can grow and learn and have a lot of fun. So there's gonna be some transformation of spaces as we transform the campus. So this is Brandon. Brandon is 13 years old and we met when he went into foster care with friends of mine and I fell in love and when he was two, I um, adopted him and he became my forever and ever little man. I am Hannah and this is my Angelina and this is Emma and Angelina is 11, Emma is 10 and they both I have, you. I love you too, they both have a genetic condition on their 22nd chromosome and Angelina also has autism. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. He has kind of all different special needs issues, but he also is just an incredibly happy, loving, fun little guy that is just a joy to be around and one of the biggest blessings in my life. It's also a little difficult and challenging, as you can tell, but this is my life. This is the way it is, so. And you have to ignore it. And you have to ignore it. <laughs> the special needs ministry actually is the reason that we came to Calvary. I had heard about the special needs ministry here and we decided to check it out. From day one, it just felt like a perfect mm. fit for him. When I say that I felt welcome, is, is an understatement. You know, most of the time it's people turning away from us or wondering why is this kid making this noise wherever we go. But here everybody wants, you know, arms open wide and for people to celebrate Mama, Angelina Mama, and to celebrate Mama, Emma, it just, um, it overwhelms me. I don't have actually, I don't have adequate words, honestly. You have no idea. When we come into Calvary, people are, you know, saying hi to him and accepting him just as he is and not expecting him to be any different, which I think is amazing and is a huge testament to Calvary as a whole. Coming to church every Sunday and not having to worry for me to be able just to go and sit and be a part of worship and be a part of, of the word and not have to worry about my girls. I know that they are getting the same thing, but with over and above love, over and above care. Uh, amazing. I'm so, so grateful. I don't know if they got you, but it got me again. Uh, I even uh, sort of stopped what I was doing the other day, watching that video for the first time, and I said, Lord, all right, Lord, if I were to stand before you one day and give an account for how I've served you, if the only thing I could show for it was I pastored a church where these two ladies were impacted and loved, and that was all I had to show for decades of service, I would be satisfied. And then I think, I think, uh, I think when we get to through generations, we're just going to deepen and widen that impact. And, and then I said to the Lord, "All right, twenty million dollars is a lot, Lord." And most people would look at a return on investment if you said, "Okay, we did this whole project, but we just reached two more moms like that." Most people would say that's a horrible return on investment, Sean. But if that's all that happened through generations, I think it'd be worth it. I think that'd be worth it. And, and like the Thompsons and, and this couple, it's gonna take us to move beyond good intentions and sincerity and today make commitment with active generosity to leave a lasting legacy in these lives and the lives of people yet to come. And, and in this moment, we got to be able to eagerly celebrate the opportunity to give. We need to, we need to willingly exercise the freedom to give because God has been good to us. And we need to set aside any of the excuses that could easily mount why we won't give or we won't step out and let God stretch us by faith and go a little further than would, that which would seem reasonable to us. Because with the Thompsons and with Tracy and Hannah and their kids, and those will yet impact, 
We want to be with them to see them reach great milestones, even to ultimately cross the finish line and be with Jesus, whole and together in Christ. At the 5K, PrayFit 5K last week, that was a great success. Thanks for all who came and all the resources that, that came in. All are going to special needs ministry. At the 5K, there was a one-mile walk or stroll or roll, um, and Brandon joined that. And Brandon, by far, was the last one to cross the line. But they told people he was still coming, so stick around to celebrate. And this is a boy who was told he would never walk. And watch as uh, our special needs director, Gina Spivey, crosses the line with him far after everybody else crosses the line. And we want to continue doing this with families. Isn't that great? Man, that's great. And that visualizes to me what we want to do with, with, through our, our capturing the space. You know, we have three goals, to capture the space. We're going to capture some space for middle school like we did with high school. And we're going to do something that's going to impact that generation in a vital way. Capturing some storage that can actually be uh, one of the larger rooms for us in, in ministry and transforming our campus so that early childhood, elementary, adults, all ages are affected. We are more efficient, secure, and safe and areas designed for those age groups. And then to extend the blessing, we want to we be there to walk people uh, forward in the journey of life that can be difficult and challenging, those who've been affected uh, by financial crisis in their lives. They're struggling to make ends meet. Those are the three goals of this campaign, to capture the space, transform the campus, and then extend the blessing and make that building a gift to our community. Let me ask you then, are we the kind of generation they were in David's day? Are you ready to commit and give so, others, so other generations can be reached with the hope, love, and message of Jesus? I am. Leslie and I are. We're ready. I can tell you leadership is. And now is our moment. Now is our time to move beyond good intention, sincerity, maybe even wishful thinking, and say, okay, here we go, God. Stretch us, use us for your glory. Father, help us, each one of us here, to be ready and willing to commit above and beyond what we, we give regularly here to make a difference in the lives of the Thompsons and all the families they represent. Some not even here yet. And then for our opportunity to keep impacting Tracy and Hannah and their kids and even those who aren't even here yet. Use us. We pray in our commitment. In Jesus' name, amen.